to three left and three right and narrow it. 20. Two right jumps cut into six left. 20. Line. 20. Open hairpin right. 20. Six right. 50. Five right into four left and five right. 50. Turn. Tight square right after three. And square left. 20. Hi, I'm Jonathan Green. Welcome once again to Inside Rally, the show where they try to teach me the finer points of rally driving. Now, as you can see, I'm in the car, but something's not quite right. That's right, I'm in the passenger seat this week because we're going to do a co-driving course. Now, I reckon that these guys are the real unsung heroes of rally, and I also think that this course is going to be far more challenging than any of us probably think, but I'm really looking forward to it. Let's give it a whirl. Join me later in the show when I'll be taking a look at the history of rallying. Well, we'll hear more from Natalie a little bit later, but now it's time for me to join my co-driving course. Well, what's co-driving? Well, if you've ever sat in a car with perhaps your girlfriend or a mate or your mum, and you've just sort of felt a little bit nervous because you're not in control of the car, that's what a co-driver goes through day in, day out. But of course, he's going over 100 miles an hour. And also, the responsibility is on the co-driver to tell the driver exactly where to go and at what speed. A lot of responsibility and a nerve-wracking exercise, I'm sure. But a very important one, especially in rally. If you get it wrong, the driver gets it wrong, and you both end up over the ravine and most times out of 10 the co-driver is the one that gets the blame. So I'm going to learn all about that and the first part is a sort of sit down classroom experience to learn the basics of it and then hopefully later this afternoon I'm going to take Pete out or Pete's going to take me out and I'm going to do the pace notes so I better get it right. So let's learn about co-driving. Well with me on the co-driver's course today is David Price, he's the editor of a motorsport magazine and also Tom Naylor, who recently won the lottery. Good luck, Tom. He seems to be a lucky fella. Good morning, and uh, welcome to Bilguin Rally School. My name's Calvin Coolidge, and I'll be your instructor for the day on the co-driver's course. What is a co-driver? A co-driver can be described as the unsung hero of a rally crew. He or she is the one person who invariably gets the blame when things go wrong. Uh, co-drivers can be directly responsible for a large number of things, including booking hotels, entry forms, movement schedules for all team personnel, service schedules, timing, navigation, map reading, pace note reading. You need to be fully conversant with the rules and regulations of the particular event you're attending. Do, do you need any experience or do you need a qualification before you can actually get some experience of co-driving? No, you don't. No, there's, uh, there's, there's just the, uh, the license which uh, your normal competition license, which you just pass the uh, the examination on that. That's all. But other than that, it's just uh, it's picking up as you go along, really. And you pick it up by experience, asking other co-drivers and things like that. So the pre-event duties. It is essential that the co-driver, as the co-driver, you are aware of everything that is going on. Entry form. Fill in the entry form and send it off to the event organisers. State on the form where final instructions are to be posted. A movement schedule, whether it be a complicated seven, eight, nine, ten page schedule, or whether it's just a sheet of A4. This is just to make sure all team members are aware of the hotel address and directions, departure times, scrutineering times, location, essential telephone numbers, etc. Just so that everybody's aware of everything that's going on. Co-driver's equipment. The helmet. It's quite, oh, it's an extremely important piece of equipment, not only on safety, but it's important to get the correct helmet because you're going to be wearing this a lot and it's, uh, you've got to get something that's comfortable. You can buy either full face or open face. This particular helmet has got uh, an intercom built into it. The boom mic there and the headset inside already fixed in. Right, to go with that, you've got to these days wear a race suit. You've got to wear these nowadays. There are various sorts you can get, single, 
uh, double layer and triple layer, but the triple layer is the, uh, is the better one of the lot. Of course, it's always the most expensive as well. Then we come to boots. Slightly shorter. Again, it's got the homologation uh, badge in there. They've got a little bit more of a substantial sole, and they are, they're much better for uh, pushing a car, to be perfectly honest. So if you're going to get boots, go for the proper co-driver's boots and not the, uh, the ones that make, really do look the part. <laughs> Right, neck brace. Now this is something that really I would suggest all co-drivers wear. You're bouncing about in the car and you're normally sat down, you've got a book in front of you and you're reading pace notes. You're, not, you're only looking up every now and again. Your driver can see everything so he can see when there's bumps. You're bouncing about all over the place. Well, we've got a little coffee break now in our co-driving course, so it's a chance for me to talk to uh, my cohorts today. First of all, Dave, I know you did the bars uh, exam last week, but uh, why did you want to do this particular course? Really to get a bit more of an understanding, you know, what goes into a rally and, and, and also getting another point of view from, you know, the other side of the car, if you like. Because um, I think if you're going to go into something, it always helps to know both sides of it. Tom, what about yourself? Why did you decide to... Uh, well, I came a fortnight ago to do a bit of rally driving on a red letter day with my two brother-in-laws. And uh, I got talking to um, one of the drivers who does um, rally driving for charity, basically. And uh, he asked me if I'd sponsor him. And then he suggested uh, he might be a, a car driver with him. I didn't realise it was so complicated, basically. Um, there was a lot to learn, but, um, you know, with a bit of luck, I'll get through it. I think that's the hardest part, is just getting the psychological effect that you're not in control. If you, if, you, if you drive a car yourself, you can almost accept the consequences. But when you're out of control, i.e. you're sitting in the passenger seat, and there's nothing you can do except advise, <laughs> it's a bit frightening. Well, that's it for the co-driving course for a moment. But as they say, let's go over the crest and fast right and go straight to Natalie. If your idea of rallying is high-performance cars racing against the clock, and also people spending vast amounts of money to buy the best equipment possible to ultimately get their driver to victory, then you're probably right. But rallying hasn't always been so. Join me as I take a closer look and delve into the history of this awe-inspiring form of motorsport. Perhaps we should start by looking at the definition of the word rally. The English dictionary tells us the verb rally means to bring or to come together for a common purpose. In the early days of the sport, the term rally meant just that. Eager competitors would start off from a wide variety of different locations and rally to a communal point where they would start their event. This was particularly the case with world famous events like the historic Monte Carlo Rally, a gathering that saw wealthy competitors starting from locations all over Europe ending up in Monaco for the commencement of the official rally. In the early days of the motor car, the very first events were basically road races from one town to another. But because the element of car reliability played such an important part in establishing a winner, it was not so much the matter of being crowned victorious that really meant something, but more the sense of achieving and having actually reached the finish line in one piece. Man's love affair with the motor car and making it go faster and faster has never shown signs of slowing down not since the first recorded city-to-city -city race in 1894. It was in this year that the world's first recorded car rally took place, the Paris to Rouen race in France, and with it rallying was born. Just like today's current crop of cars, vehicles and events carried passengers and were flagged off the start line at regular timed intervals, again just like today's modern rallying. The Paris to Rouen event requires nerves of steel and a certain amount of navigation, but the real challenge was to actually get to the finish, never mind how long it took. The overall winner was the crew to be first across the finishing line in the Rouen by covering the correct route. Nearly 110 years later, the romance and passion and basic concept for rallying has remained the same, to cover the correct route in the shortest possible time. Right, uh, we move on to maps. In the UK, these are provided by Ordnance Survey and we primarily use the 1 to 50,000 and 1 to 25,000 series maps. So that's the, uh, that's the map there. You can see all the, the numbers on the top, which corresponds to the ones on the bottom as well, and the left and the right hand side. Now these are the numbers that we use to plot a grid reference. 
Egypt, there's different phrases that uh, are used. Eastings, then northings, crawl before you can walk. And these are all phrases that are used in conjunction with plotting a, a map reference. On the map itself, you can only put on the, on the map what's given to you in the road book. You get a road book from the organisers when you start the rally to get you round from on the road sections. You plot the stage out and the information that they give you, they give you all these junction numbers where something's happening. Number three, there's a bridge. Four, five, six, it narrows. Different things like that. You can put those, you can enter those onto the map. So guys, uh, I wonder what your thoughts on it. Dave, like myself, was asking a lot of questions. Tom, you were taking it all quietly on board. What did you reckon? Trying to, it's very complicated. More complicated than I thought it would be. Do you reckon you'd be all right on, on, on the rally, reading the pace notes, etc.? My only worry is my stomach. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's really complicated. It's, 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 it is an eye opener, especially to go from, you know, we talked about the maps and the and the the, uh, the pace notes. So yeah, um, don't know. So if you're worried <laughs> about your stomach, you wouldn't want your full face helmet anymore. No, right? no, <laughs> probably. <laughs> sort of a, a quick exit might be uh, a needed. I don't think people realise what actually goes into it. I think it all just, people think it just you know, miraculously happens, so. There's a lot of preparation involved, isn't there? Hell of a lot of preparation, oh dear. <laughs> so these drivers all dishing their, their co-drivers, I think I'm actually, secretly, they've got a bit more respect than we give them credit. Yeah, yeah. Well, welcome back to Inside Rally, the show where they try to teach me how to become a rally driver. Now today, we've been doing the co-drivers course, and later I'll be taking a closer look at what pace notes, that's the shorthand, is all about, and see if I can get my head around that. On the pace notes uh, section again, there is a key here for all of the abbreviations that you can use. Uh, either they come on organisers' notes, or you can use these abbreviations yourself when you're writing your own pace notes. So I'm going along, you said six left, yep. 70. So I know that after I've gone slightly left. 70 metres. I've got 70 metres. Yeah. And, and you then the next one. Between there and then, you're going to give me the next call. Yes, yeah. As I'm coming, normally it would, it would be, whatever it is, six left loose, 70. As you're on the six left loose, I'd be then giving you five left minus 30. So literally, I've got my head through that bend. Yep. And as I've gone apex to yep. or whatever. You know you've got 70 metres. And I'm, I'm giving you that one before. As we're coming, just coming into that one, you'll have had the 70, I'll be giving you the five left minus, 30. We'll do the 70 metres, get to the five left minus, I'll then be going four right into three left plus. As you can see there, that's underlined, so that comes out all as one. But I suppose as you get to know a driver, you, you can then formulate a bit more of a style for him? Yes, or yes, yes, you can do. Or her. So when you're sat in the car, yeah. You have this literally on your knee, or yeah. you're holding this? Yeah, I'm holding it there. And, and this? That would be, uh, normally I'd have that on a board, and I'd, I would hold it on my hand like this, and have the potty on the top like that, and just follow the road through, and just keep reading it and reading it. i tell you what, I'd need a potty to be able to do this. <laughs> <laughs> do you think the driver puts more trust or faith in the notes than in the map? Yeah, it's got to. Yeah. No matter how good a co-driver is or a navigator that can read a map, a driver who's given you his description of the road, he's got to prefer that uh, to uh, the information we're given off a map. Given, obviously, that a rally driver is trying to go as fast as possible and most of the time trying to make up time because you may not be leading or you're trying to hold the lead, yeah. and you, you're confident with each other, is it just up to the driver? If you say it's four right and he goes, well, I've kind of got to take this a bit faster than I normally, is there any interaction where you will give him the leeway and say, can cut or you can do this or, you know what I mean? If it's, if it's in the notes, yes, you can, you can obviously say uh, four left, four right, cut. Um, if it's not in there, you wouldn't say it. Uh, the driver is the one who's reading the road. He can see the road in front of him. If he decides to take that chance and try and cut a little bit off the corner, then that's the chance he takes. It's, it's a risk. But if the driver is getting a little bit wild, then it's up to the co-driver to slow him down. You've got to, you've got to, you've got to talk to him because otherwise you're going to go off. Well, we finished the classroom part of the course, and I have to say we packed a lot in in, in a few hours. Uh, gentlemen, what did you think? First of all, Dave, what did you reckon? 
really useful. It, it, it teaches you a lot of what goes on, you know, in, in the day. And I think it's something that all drivers, as well as you know, potential co-drivers, should do. So. And Tom, you started this morning saying you were going to have a go. Do you feel like you're uh, up and able for it now? Uh, not at the moment. I think uh, once I've got my head around all the the figures and you know, it's basically short and you've got to learn to get used to it. Uh, once I've got my head around that, I think I'll be all right. Yeah. All right, that's the classroom bit over. Now it's time for the practical. My chance to go out in a car with Pete again, but this time as the co-driver doing the pace notes. Now that's the one thing that worries me a little bit because the language is fairly basic, but there's a lot of terms to actually learn. And I'm worried about, it's all very well doing it in the classroom on paper, but actually doing it speed in a car when you're bumping around, that's a whole different story. Now the plus side is, ha <laughs> ha, I spent a couple of weeks with him telling me to listen. Now he's got to listen to me. Trouble is, if I don't get it right, he'll have the last laugh. Right, moment of truth. Remember this man, the driver, Pete. Yes. I've got the notes. <laughs> now tell me, what, what do you expect in terms of, I've gone through the basics with Calvin and I've got the idea. Yeah. What are you expecting from me? Well really, just to, to read those back to me at the right speed for what we're going around the stage. Uh, keeping them nice and clear. Obviously, the bits you need to read out quickly, you need to read out very quickly, but still very clearly. If I get it wrong, being a driver, will you ignore that, or do you trust your own instincts, or, I mean, in terms of if you were doing a real rally? <coughs> Would be off if you got it wrong, because I'd only go on what you say. Only? Yeah. Five, four, three, two, one, go. Into six right, 20, six right, 50, Five right into four left, braking over 20 into hairpin right 20. Line six right 50 and right bumpy don't cut, narrow exit 20. Second right, uh, two right don't cut into six left 20. Line 20. Open hairpin right 20. Six right, 50, into right, into four left, and five right, 50. Four right, bumpy, don't cut, and five left, opening to six left, and tightening into three left, and three right, narrow exit, 20. Three left, four right, 20. Six right, breaking over, 20. Into hairpin right, 20. Line, six right, 50. Two right, don't cut. Into six left, 20. Line, 20. Open hairpin right. Turn mid, square left, four finish. Flying finish. Take it, we missed that then. Yes. Well, I've managed to navigate my way out of the car and I'm sure Pete's quite happy about that fact. So let's turn our attention once again to Natalie. One of the reasons why rallying has changed over the years and become so commercially aware is that car manufacturers could see the value in promoting the durability of their product over such harsh racing conditions. Circuit racing is another way of demonstrating the strength and performance of your cars. But unlike rallying, circuit racing provides ultra-smooth tarmac coupled with minimum wear and tear on components. This is in a sharp contrast to rallying, which is often held over closed public roads or forestry commission roads, whether it be icy and cold or baking hot sun. Environments in which everyday motorists are unlikely to face even in a lifetime of driving. So through this example of punishment, the car manufacturer can promote the durability of their product to the public in a truthful and visual exciting way no other form of advertising can contest with. Nowadays, most of the major events are all about flat-out driving. Long gone are the early basic ingredients of rallying, navigating, impassable roads, travelling all night and repairing your own car at the side of the road. Some would argue as a result, a lot of the adventurous spirit that made rallying so popular has now been removed, making the sport more like circuit racing. Be that as it may, rallying in all its forms is highly addictive and one of the best sports either to take part in or to watch. 
With the president of the FAA, Max Mosley, stating that within the next five to ten years he predicts rallying will be as popular as Formula One, we all wait with bated breath to see what happens to this sport which has come from such humble beginnings. Right, well, we've just got out of the car with my first experience of co-driving, and I have to say, a massive eye-opener. I had no idea, first of all, just how fast it was, because I don't think I've ever been that fast in a car, and then having the responsibility of having to tell Pete what to do and keep up with it and try and keep with him as he's driving flat out. Um, <laughs> I don't know have any idea how I got on, but um, it was a blur the first time, but you tell me. I'm going to say, no, the first time was not so good. No, you're a little bit too far ahead, sometimes too early you know so you're calling things much too as we're close to the corner you're actually calling it there so therefore it's very late but then other things you're calling so far ahead that we hadn't got there and it's just adjusting to get used to the speed but the other thing is you just need to look up a little bit more <laughs> you know, said and done. it is yeah but you need to look up to pick a reference point right but were you genuinely listening to me rather than just driving your own yeah yeah well, if you didn't tell me to do anything like the narrow exit then obviously I'm not going to realise there's a narrow exit there. So I'll just listen and do what you're telling me. It's genuine autopilot then? Yeah, yeah. Now you've really frightened me because <laughs> I was, I mean, I, I mean, you know, obviously I was trying to do it as best I could, but I had no idea that you were genuinely waiting for my words before you made your decision on how quick or whatever you were going to... No, a driver can make a little mistake and get away with it. And nine times out of ten, nobody will actually know that they've made a little mistake. Co-driver makes one, everybody knows. No, so there's more pressure on them to get it right than there really is on, on the driver. Well, for me, the co-driving course has been quite incredible. I had absolutely no idea of the responsibility it takes to sit on this side of the car and direct the driver. And it's so frightening to look up and realise that if you get it wrong, you're both going off. I think I'm going to stick to the driving, or at least I feel as though I've got a bit of control. Well, that's it, though, for this week. Join us next time for more Inside Rally.